Hello everyone, my name is Mark Batty and I'm the Subject Advisor for Edexcel History and Politics. The purpose of this video is to provide some general feedback on the first summer series for A-Level Politics, looking at some of the key challenges faced by students across all three papers. Firstly, some good news for politics teachers. The British public is more interested in politics than at any time since 1991. According to a recent study by Natsen, more people across all age groups expressed an interest in politics, and since 2015 were no longer seen a marked drop in young voters in the 18 to 24 age group. More young people now recognise the greater difference between the parties and can identify with the different parties, so this bodes well for the take-up of politics in schools and colleges. As we can see, record numbers of students are now taking A-level politics. Since 2011, the number of politics students nationally has gone up from around 15,000 to around 20,000, which is a significant increase overall, making politics one of the fastest growing A-level subjects. At Edexcel, summer 2019 was our biggest ever entry for A-level politics with over 14,000 students. We're really pleased with how the new specification has been received by teachers and we feel that overall the first exam series went very smoothly. Obviously it's not been without its challenges. A lot of teachers have expressed concerns about the amount of content in the new specifications, but it's important to understand that the content is set by the Department for Education and the new A-levels were designed to be more challenging. This does mean that universities and employers will recognise the merit and academic rigour in the new A-level politics qualification. At Pearson, we've worked hard to support you through the teaching of the new specification by providing a lot of free support and guidance, and in this video I'll be able to give you an update on some of the new materials available to you this term. It's great that A-Level Politics has become so popular and I'm always coming across teachers that are setting up new politics departments in schools, so there's clearly scope for the subject to grow further. As well as being a fascinating subject in its own right, politics really complements the study of other humanities and social science subjects such as history, economics, law, sociology and geography. We're also seeing more and more students going to university to study degrees in subjects like politics and international relations, as well as related subjects like history. Obviously there's no GCSE in politics, so the first time many students come across the subject is at A-level. However, there are close links with the GCSE Citizenship Studies specifications, so if you're looking to engage younger students with the subject, it may be worth having a look at our citizenship specifications, which were reformed in 2016. For teachers who are new to our specification, I just want to provide a brief overview of the qualification structure and which options are available. In the Edexcel specification, there are three to our question papers and each paper carries one third of the overall marks. Paper one is UK politics with core political ideas, conservatism, liberalism and socialism. In section A, students have a choice of source question and essay questions on UK politics. There's then a choice of two essays on the core ideas. Now all three core ideas have to be taught in case there are two essays on one idea. Paper 2 is on UK government and a non-core political idea of your choice. Again, Paper 2 is assessed through sources and essays on UK government content and a choice of essays on your chosen political idea. The most popular non-core ideas are feminism and nationalism. Anarchism and ecologism are less popular and multiculturalism is the least popu popular option available. Paper 3 is an optional comparative politics paper. Teachers can choose to offer US or global politics. Last summer we saw just under 10,000 entries for the US option and almost 4,500 entries for global. We were really pleased with the entries for global politics as it's never been as popular in the old specification. So clearly the availability of published resources has really helped make it more popular and it's good that teachers have the choice available in our specification. We're now going to have a quick look at the assessment objectives which underpin the assessment of the new specification. These were developed in consultation with Ofqual and the other awarding organisations and they're common to all politics specifications. They govern how marks throughout our assessments are allocated. It's worth becoming familiar with them as they guide question structure and will be referred to when looking at assessments and mark schemes. Note the difference between the weightings of AS and A-level. The demand is different at A-level with more emphasis on AO2 and AO3. 
This is therefore reflected in the demand of the A-level questions and should be demonstrated by teachers in their teaching. There are some other changes from the old politics course, which is worth mentioning. The old AO3, which dealt with the use of correct voc vocabulary and communicating coherent arguments, has disappeared. Now we ensure that students are awarded for correct use of vocabulary and how they structure their arguments in the level-based mark schemes, which apply to all extended answer questions. The old AO2, which dealt with analyse and evaluate, has now been split, as you can see on the table, into two assessment objectives, AO2, analyse, and AO3, evaluate. If we consider how the new assessment objectives performed this summer, AO1 and AO2 presented little difficulty with students often demonstrating clear evidence of knowledge and understanding and good analysis. However, AO3 was an area of weakness for a lot of students across all three papers. Remember that AO3 is no longer a lesser mark for communication, it's now an equal partner for marks with the other two AOs, which means that the students need to ensure their essays are sufficiently evaluative to meet this new demand. To score highly, AO3 must be evident throughout an answer. It can't be ignored or given scant coverage. Students also need to ensure they form a judgment and reach a verdict, presenting a reasoned conclusion. We saw a lot of candidates sitting on the fence and failing to do this. That doesn't mean that students can't present sophisticated arguments. It just means that they have to reach a verdict. It doesn't matter if the verdict is by a large margin or a small one. They have to take sides and the essay can never be a draw. One way of doing this is to construct mini conclusions for each argument. There may be winning and losing arguments on both sides and some may be close, but in the end they have to get to a winning side, a conclusion to the entire debate. We get a lot of queries from teachers asking how we want students to structure their essays. Pearson at Excel does not insist or recommend that there is only one form of essay writing in which to frame responses. There are a wide range of approaches and methods which are all perfectly valid. The key thing is that all students are different and they need to follow an approach that suits them provided they meet the required assessment objectives. Some students may prefer to take the approach of looking at points for, then points against, then providing an overarching conclusion. Now this is fine, but students do need to make sure that they are meeting the requirements for AO3. An approach which looks at kind of point, counterpoint, then mini conclusion, sewing in AO3 as the essay progresses, may help the students get the one third of the marks for AO3, but obviously it's a more challenging way of writing an essay. Another area of weakness seen by examiners is essays which are large in narrative, often telling a story but lacking in any analysis and evaluation. This sort of response can score highly for AO1, but that's only a third of the marks so they're missing out on two-thirds of the marks available because of the lack of AO2 and AO3. Another area of weakness with essays was a lack of planning. Weaker responses were often not well planned or thought through, and these candidates often change their views and opinions regularly in the response. It's really important that students spend a few minutes carefully thinking and planning an essay before start write, they start writing. They need to think carefully about the question, what points are they going to use to support and challenge it? Think about what their conclusion will be before they start writing, rather than deciding halfway through. Think also about presenting a logical chain of reasoning. Essentially, there should be a thread that runs right the way through the essay, from the introduction to the conclusion, so that by the time we get to the conclusion, it shouldn't be a surprise. So it's best if we arrive at the conclusion with credible incremental steps in the essay, rather than it being a spurious judgment at the end of the essay, which we didn't expect. Please also remember that essays can now be based on two or more topics from across the specification for that particular component. There are also synoptic requirements for certain questions, which require students to make links to other parts of the specification. This makes essays more challenging for students, as they need to think about the bigger picture and draw on links between different areas of content. It also means that students need to think on their feet a bit more in the examinations, so it's really important that they read the question carefully and try to answer the specific question set rather than one they wish they were set or one they practiced at home which was similar. Papers 1 and 2 both contain 24 mark essays on ideas. In paper 1 it's the core ideas and paper 2 the non-core ideas. 
With both the core and non-core political ideas, students must refer to appropriate thinkers to support their answers. Each political idea has five named key thinkers in the specification, which are stipulated by the DfE. Candidates who do not refer to at least two of these key thinkers in their responses cannot get above level two in the mark scheme. They are free to use other key thinkers in addition, as long as they make sure they include two from the spec for that specific idea. It was pleasing to note that most students were able to include relevant key thinkers in their responses, and few students were affected by the cap. It's worth noting though that the better responses didn't simply name drop the key thinkers, but they actually explained their contribution and importance to the idea. Another challenging aspect of assessment was the 30 mark source question, which appear in paper one and paper two. Every source will contain a contested issue. So for example, in paper one this summer, there was a source which considered whether the outcomes of general elections are predictable or whether they can spring surprises, making the results more volatile. So there'll always be competing alternatives which have to be detailed for AO1, analyzed for AO2, and then a verdict needs to be reached on which is stronger and why for AO3. Many students treated the source question as more of an essay, ignoring the points provided in the source. Another area of weakness was to give a binary debate but offer no real judgment or conclusion. Some students veered too far away from the content of the source in their responses. Examiners could reward this for AO1, provided it was relevant to the question, but it's not permitted as a means of gaining AO2 or AO3 marks. So to clarify, AO1 is about identifying the points from the source clearly and correctly and providing relevant supporting information and exemplification from your own knowledge. It's also possible to bring in own knowledge to develop or build on points in the source or to provide counterpoints. The crucial thing is to avoid introducing new own knowledge which has no linkage to the source. This needs to be avoided. All AO1 points considered must link to the points in the source to get credit for AO2 and AO3. So the marks for AO2 and AO3 cannot be rewarded for material that has no linkage to the points raised in the source. The AO2 analysis must be balanced, so both sides of the argument must be considered when examining the issue in the question. Some candidates simply agreed with one side in the debate and failed to provide academic evaluation to reject the opposing view. However, the key thing which limited responses was a failure to commit to one side and say why that side was stronger. The AO3 requires a student to reach judgment on which side of the binary debate they support. As with essays, they can come down heavily on one side of the debate, or they can say it's a very close call, but they do have to make a call on which side is stronger and say why. They cannot study politics for two years and then have no justified opinion on contested issues such as our electoral system or party system. Okay, so that concludes our general feedback on the summer series. We'll be providing much more detailed feedback in our pre-recorded feedback events, which will be available on our website around Christmas time. There'll be a one event for each paper and they'll contain marked exemplar work. We've also got a lot of support for teachers already available on our website and more coming soon. The summer 2019 question papers, mark schemes and examiner's reports are available now on our website and the examiner's reports contain exemplar work with comments. There's lots of assessment guidance and FAQs available online too, such as templates for students to help approach different question types and a summary of assessment of each question type, which tells you things like whether a conclusion is needed or whether there's synoptic links. We've recently posted some guidance on A-level source-based assessment and some further advice about synopticity comparisons and links in question papers. If you need help in finding any of these materials, please feel free to contact us for advice. You can also email in any specific questions, which will be answered by our subject advisor or senior examiners through Ask the Expert. Don't forget that you can still use Results Plus to analyse your students' performance from the summer exam series, and our free access to script service is available until 13th of December this year. As well as the pre-recorded training events, we're also running some online events for teachers who are new to Edexcel A-level politics, and also some events looking in more detail at the assessment objectives and how they're applied when marking exemplar scripts. You can book a place on these events via our training page. If you're interested in becoming an examiner for politics, you can apply online. We're always looking for new examiners, and it's a great way of developing an understanding of the mark schemes and the assessment objectives.
If you have any specific questions, please feel free to contact us using the form on our website. The links are shown on screen. You can also sign up for regular email updates so you can keep up to date with any news, training events and support documents. That concludes this session reflecting on the first series of politics exams. Thank you for listening and I hope you found it useful.